Hello everyone, this is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 21 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Now, OK, this is episode 21. Um, there's really not much to review. There's a lot to preview, by the way, but there's not really much to review. There was only three or four fights we're going to mention. There really wasn't much boxing, and there hasn't been for the last couple of weeks. Just something I want to just tell everybody, if you don't know, before we get into part one, is that there's an interview that I myself have done with one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best, in a lot of people's opinions, heavyweights of all time, Larry Holmes. Uh, that's only available on YouTube. If you go on YouTube, you can type in Box Hard Podcast. You'll find our channel. All of our episodes that get uploaded to SoundCloud are also on YouTube and various other sites. But YouTube, you can find everything. We're not actually going to be putting the Larry Holmes interview on SoundCloud. It's purely going to be on YouTube. So head over to YouTube and watch that. It's quite good. It's an interview we did last week over the phone. And it's it's an interesting interview because it's one that I don't think he's really done any interviews for the past couple of years they're hard to find so head over there and check that out as soon as possible okay so we're going to review a couple of fights now and then we're going to bring on our first guest on this week's show we're just going to you know keep part one nice and compact and then we're going to bring part two and in part two we are going to be break you know breaking down all the fights that are taking place this weekend and trust me there's a lot of them okay we're going to start with a clash that took place last weekend Fedor Chudinov against Felix Sturm. Now, this is his second defence. Of course, he he won the title when he faced Sturm back back last year. He then defended it against our very own Frank Buglioni. And this was the rematch, the the rematch, obviously, between Sturm and, and Chudinov. Now, Sturm was, he seemed to sort of start fast, but A combination, and and I really mean combinations upon combinations of body shots, seemed to slow Sturm down going into the latter part of the fight. Um, Fedor Chudinov, who I picked to win this fight, I thought he may have even knocked out Felix Sturm. It ended up going to the decision after 12 rounds, and a majority decision was awarded in Felix Sturm's favour. So now Felix Sturm, the five-time, the only five-time world champion from Germany. So a massive achievement for him, but anybody who's watched the fight, it was a bit fishy. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are giving it to Chudinov. I think maybe 95% of people think Chudinov should have won that fight, including me and I, as I think you're with Chudinov as well. I think Chudinov won the fight. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It was, it was clear. It was a daylight robbery. Um, a lot of people are bashing the German board and it's all it's all going a bit crazy but it seems it seems really unfair for Chudinov because you know a lot of people don't really look into it they don't really think they don't really think about you know Chudinov this was his dream to become a world champion fair enough he did become a world champion and he really should have kept the title and he was robbed and it's it's a horrible feeling because now he's got to you know take a step back and and have to fight up up to the level again and hopefully win another title. But he really should be the world champion still. And Sturm, you know, he's now going to be viewed as one of the weakest champions in the division. Um, lots and lots of people are talking about him now. We're hearing stuff about Paul Smith wanting to fight him. We're hearing stuff about Jamie Cox wanting to knock him out. So a lot of stuff that that is attracted. We're going to move off of that fight now. Francesco Pianetta was on the undercard. This is the cancer survivor. He was in a heavyweight contest against Hassan Olaki. Now, it was only scheduled for six, but Pianetta got the TKO in round five. So Pianetta now 32 wins, two losses and one draw. Elsewhere on the same night, Jesse Magdaleno, he was out in Arizona. He got his 23rd career win with a KO in the seventh round over Ray Perez. So Jesse Magdaleno now 23-0. and 0. Also in America, 
Diego De La Hoya picked up a fourth round KO. He defeated Arturo Badillo. Diego De La Hoya was actually cut on his left eye, which was caused by an accidental head clash in round two. Uh, Badillo was down and out from a body shot in round four, and that was all that she wrote. There's only one other fight really to mention that took place from last weekend as well, and that fight is one that took place in West Midlands. Um, Sergei Rabchenko, he was out and he picked up a third round victory. It was only scheduled for six. He fought a guy called Miguel Aguila, who had a record of 11 wins and 21 losses. So a losing record. It was just a showcase fight for Rabchenko and it really ended up being a showcase performance. So, you know, um, Miguel Aguila, he actually retired are in the third round at the end of the third round. He was down in the first round from a left to the body and he was down three times in the third round until his corner decided that they didn't want to see any more. So Rabchenko now 27-1 and one as he looks to get into world title contention in the 154 division. And that's really it for the review side of things. Again, as I said, there's a lot to preview, so stay tuned for that. We're going to bring on our first guest now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the forgotten man here in the super bantamweight division in Britain is Kid Galahad. Kid, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be on your show, pal. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. The first thing I want to ask you, where have you been? What have you been up to? The the boxing scene in Britain's missing you big time. Um, I'm just being, I've had a few issues and I've been dealing with and um, I'm, I should be back very, very soon. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready to uh, to go back where I left off. Absolutely, because how long left of the ban is there to serve? I'm not too sure yet. Hopefully the, before the end of this week I find some news. And uh, I could be back sooner than uh, people expect. Oh, that'd be excellent. The first thing, yeah. I, the first real question I've got for you is: How frustrating is it to not be in the mix right now amongst Quig and Frampton? Um, you know what? I don't, I don't really look at it. I just get on with it. It's just one of them things you gotta just deal with. You can't let things get to you. You know what I mean? Everyone has the time, and uh, my time will come. Okay, positive thoughts. Um. Being out of the spotlight for a while and sitting back, sort of watching boxing from like a fan's perspective almost, yeah. has that has that been beneficial to you in any way at all? To a certain extent, yeah. But, you know, I, 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 it's not like I've been out, out of the gym or been uh, swung around or nothing. I've been been improving on my stuff that I'm not good at in the ring and just, and just uh, developing, developing as a fighter mentally and physically. Yeah, because what I was going to ask you is, with no fight in the pipeline sort of thing, how intense is the training that you're doing at the moment compared to what you would be, you know, when you're usually ticking over in between fights? If, if, if you ask anyone about me, I train like, I, when I train, I don't train half hard. I train like every session, like it's my last session. That's why I train. I don't go half halfway. I, I either just go at it. If I train, I train. I don't just, I don't go there just to, make numbers in the gym or just to take over a job i go in there to train to to get better to develop um are you still with mick hennessy um yeah i'm i'm um i'm just uh, i'm with my obviously i just leave all that side to my manager john ingle so uh whatever he he decides the best option is for me then um, i take that option okay now, of course, there's a lot of fights going on around you right now um, in your division yeah. and some other in some other divisions as well. An old foe of yourself, Jezza Dickens, I know that you've been yeah. sparring with him, giving him some work today. Um, he's yeah. fighting Rigondo, of course. Now, this is yeah. a massive fight. What what good does this bring Jezza, in your opinion, Barry? This is a win-win situation for Jezza because people don't people don't realize how good Jezza is. Jezza is a lot better than people think he is. Me personally, people think that Jazz is gonna uh, Rugonda is gonna go in there and wipe the floor with Jazza. Believe me, he ain't gonna go in there and wipe the floor with someone like Jazza. Jazza is gonna go in there and give himself a good account. And and you gotta remember, Rugonda is getting on now. I think he is he 35 or 36 this year. Jazza Jazza 25 year old. He's got youth on the side. He's hungry. He's determined. So you never know. Father Time could catch up with Rugonda in this fight. You never know. Now I know it's too early to sort of start you know, start searching for opponents and all that at the moment. But is Rigondo someone you'd love you'd love to get in there in there with once you become more active, of course? 
Yeah, of, of course it is. I, I personally believe if I personally believe if anyone's gonna go in there and take Uganda out in style, it's gonna be someone like me. That's my personal opinion. I, I personally believe. I don't believe anyone this way could could uh, deal with them the way I could deal with them. As far as like Jazz, man, Jazz has always got a chance of beating them. You never know. Boxing one shot could change the whole could change the whole game. Change the whole fight. You never know. And if he's taking Jazza lightly, then you you don't know Jazza could go out there and wipe the floor with him. That's my personal opinion. I I I believe I could be Uganda better than a Scott Quigg, a Scott Quigg or a Carl Frampton. That's my personal opinion. And you're entitled to a, to that opinion. Um, of yeah. course, a good friend of yourself, Kel Brook. He is yeah. Um, well, sort of missed out on the Khan fight. Khan's gone different ways and he's now fighting Canelo. It kind of took everyone by surprise. How do you see yeah. that fight going, kid? Do you know what? I see it. I see, doing, I see Khan doing a lot better than people think he is, than, than they think he's, he's going to do. People think of oh, because Canelo's a lot bigger, he's got a lot more weight advantage, that he's going to go in there and wipe the floor with Khan. Khan is actually in a win-win situation because no matter what, if he goes in there and gives himself a good account, people are going to say, oh yeah, I didn't expect that of Khan, he's better than he, than he thinks he, than, than he is. And then if he does lose, people are going to just turn around and say, oh well, he, he wasn't big enough for that way. If he wins, then he's in the big time. If he does win, no matter what he does, there ain't no, there's no bigger fight out there for him than the Kel Khan fight. No matter yeah. what American he fights, there's no bigger fight for him than the Kel Khan. If that fight does come off, kid, how excited would you be to see that one finally, Brook Khan? Oh, honestly, I, I personally believe Kel Brook is the best welterweight out there. He's the biggest and hardest hitting welterweight probably I've ever seen. And I honestly believe Kel Brook could go on to become light middle and middleweight world champion. I, I can't see anyone beating Kel Brook anytime soon. The only person who'll beat him is himself, which I don't think he will. Wow. That's a big statement, but yeah, of course, I yeah. know he's 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 his talents undoubted. To be totally honest, he's the way he went to America and dealt with dealt with Sean Porter. I know you was out there with with him, and it was it was it was brilliant for British boxing. I'm telling you, no one's seen no one has seen the best of Kel Brook yet. Honestly, when I see him in the gym, sometimes I look and I think, fuck you know. When I see him sparring for the kids and, and the way he's dealing with them with ease, I just think, fuck you know. You know what I mean? I just Honestly, no one's seen the best of Kel Brook. The, the better fighter you put Kel Brook in with, the better Kel Brook he'll see. He's a fighter, whatever level you put him in with, he'll make sure he's just above that. You know what I mean? Me personally, I've, I've never seen anyone as talented as Kel Brook. You know what I mean? I've seen him not train for maybe two, three months to come into the gym and it looks like he, he, he has me. It looks like he, he's never been away from the gym. Do you know what I mean? He'll, he'll come in and spar and it's like, fuck, you know. Honestly, I've never seen anyone as talented as Kel Brook with my own eyes. I've seen him spar people in America all over the world and the, the way he deals with people, it's unbelievable. He's the best talent we've got in, in the UK right now, the best world champion and the most talented athlete we've got in boxing. It's actually a question I was going to ask you. I was actually going to go, going to ask you who's the best pound for pound in Britain right now. If, if you're going to ask me who's had the best win, that's a different thing. If you say to me, talent-wise, I personally believe Kel Brook's the most talented athlete we've got in the boxing world. Yeah, in the world. I'm not, I'm not just saying in the UK, I'm saying in the world. But the best world champion who had the best win in the last 20 years, probably the best win ever in history, is Tyson Fury against, the Tyler Klitschko, against Klitschko. That was a phenomenal win. That the way he's done it win. as well. He went to the guy's backyard and mentally beat him and then physically went in there and beat him. And I, was, I personally believe he, he's the best heavyweight in the world. Yeah, it was it was it was phenomenal. So you put in I mean, what do you what do you think about these people? Of course you got, you know, Joshua now going into a world title fight, a lot of people yeah. talking on Twitter and stuff that Joshua would make easy work of Fury. What's your opinion on that? No way? Oh, no way. I'm telling you now. To who Joshua's been fighting, to Tyson Fury, to any heavyweight in the world, Tyson Fury in his, is, is, in his, Tyson Fury is on his own level. There, there's no heavyweight who you can spar or whatever who was on the same level anywhere near as Tyson Fury. There's nothing Tyson Fury can't do in that ring. Look what he did for, for, for me personally. You know the clip where Tyson beat? Yeah, v- Vladimir, yeah. AJ could, Vladimir, do you think AJ could beat him? Not right now, in my opinion, no. No, oh, not 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 right now. Do you think David A beat him? No, David A won't beat him because he's already beat David A and he'll probably do the same against David A. Could anyone out there beat him? No, there's only Tyson Fury who will beat him. The way he beat him as well, it made it look like he it made the fellow uh, Vladimir, whatever his name is, it made him look like nothing. I was there ringside and um, honestly, 
fucking hell. It was unbelievable what he was doing in the ring. Something that a heavyweight shouldn't do. It was it was excellent for British boxing. It really, really was. Um, yeah. And another thing I wanted to ask you, of course, this ban, um, it was it was set for two years. By the by, the sounds of what you're saying, it sounds like it may be shortened a bit. Will you be coming back at Super Bantam after being out that long? Yeah, of course, I, of course, I will. How long have I been out now? Forty months. Yeah, I mean, of course, like this, that sort of goes to show that you know how how much training you've been doing because there's there's some fighters i'm not going to drop names but of course you've got guys who stay out at the gym for a month or two suddenly whoo, they're ballooning up but to be out of the ring for 14 months and to be maintaining you know you're close to your fight weight should we say that goes to show that you yeah, you, know, you really have been in that gym not, you're you're yeah, an official gym rat yeah it's, it's not just that it's just the worst thing i could have done is stop training and enjoy myself for the next year and a half and then six months before a fight, I think, oh, yeah, I'm, fine. I'm starting to fight again. Let me start training again. But that year and a half of me enjoying myself and, and fucking about would have caught me in the ring. So when I, when I get back into the ring now, everything I'm telling you I've been doing, I've been, I'm, I'm more developed as a fighter. I've been working on things that I'm not good at, working things that I am good at, been doing everything. When I get back in the ring, you're going to see, you're going to be like, oh, fucking hell, he's come back better. <laughs> and I've, I've made I've made I've made that time count. I'm just just be messing about like like a, a normal fight would do. I've made sure that that time I did something useful with it. Yeah, that's fa- that's that's fantastic stuff for yourself, of course. Um, and the last question I got for you now, and this is this is the question that I really want to hear the answer to: Who wins yeah. on Saturday, Quig or Frampton, and why? I believe <clears throat> Frampton. I think Frampton's a more well-rounded fighter. I think he's better than Quig in every department. I just, I personally can't see Quig winning. I don't know what, I, I don't know what, I don't know what you can see. I, for some reason, I've got a feeling it might end up being a draw. For some reason. That's a strange you know, prediction. It could be. You don't, you never know because it, it's, Quig's already had two draws. Yeah. But that, when he boxed that Cuban, I personally thought he lost it. You're, in, you're entitled to your own opinion. <laughs> I don't know what you thought, but I, I personally thought he lost by two rounds. Yeah. But you never know. I can't I can't see Quig beating. The only way I can see Quig beating Frampton, if Frampton goes in there, guns blazing, and gets caught with a shot, he shouldn't have got caught with. But I know Frampton's not a stupid fighter. I know uh, Shane McGuigan is not a stupid trainer. He's not going to go in there and tell him, yeah, you need to go, go in there. He's going to stick to the boxer and step out, step... Hit from hit Quig and step out. Hit Quig and step to the side, because Quig won't know what to do. And and uh, I personally believe he, he'll make the fight look a lot easier than it, than it should be. But no doubt, it's definitely one that we're all going to be glued to the TV sets and watching. Yeah, of course. Even 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 I'm excited for for to see them both fight. Who, who everyone should be excited because we've got two world champions from Britain fighting. You know, fighting. Everything's on the line, and and they're going to go in there and, and give it the all. You know what I mean? Absolutely. The only way it can be disappointed if one of them does it, what um, Aubrey Harrison or David A do, you know, like when Aubrey Harrison went in there and said, oh, I'm going to do this and do that, then got in the ring and do, didn't do fuck all. Or when David A said the exact same about when he boxed that clutch goal and everyone paid to watch him and then he, and then he fucking bottled it and then blamed it on his little toe. <laughs> We don't want that, do we? We want people would give their their little their little toll to be in them big fights like that. So when you're not when you get to that to that level and you get opportunity, you have to make sure it counts. You gotta go in there and give it your all. Okay, kid. Well, listen. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving giving us a bit of your time. Um, of no course, problem. we're gonna be looking. We're going to be looking for your return to the ring. We cannot wait for that. We cannot wait till you're back in the picture. Well, you keep your eyes and ears open this week or next week because there could be some good news coming out very, very soon. Right, that's an, that's an exclusive. You heard it here first. Thank you very much for coming on the show, kid, and we'll speak to you again soon. All right, then, mate. Take care. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for part two. Now, this part is called the preview part, where we preview the forthcoming fights this weekend. We're actually going to start with something that should be happening on the Friday. I'm looking at the Friday schedule now on Box Rec, and there's nothing listed there for for Billy Dib, but apparently Billy Dib, he was on the show, of course, a couple of weeks back, a really touching interview, if you missed it, you should go and check that out, he is supposed to be fighting on the 26th of February, which is the Friday, 
but there seems to be nothing listed. So hopefully that fight still goes ahead. We'll have to look out for that. That's really it for Friday. So we're going to move straight over to Saturday. Okay, we're actually going to start over in Germany. Our very own Ola Afalabi faces Marco Huck. Now, these guys have faced each other three times before. On two occasions, Marco Huck got the win, and on one occasion, it was a draw. So this is going to be the fourth time they fought each other. It's a little bit like a Pacquiao Marquez type scenario, but it's in the cruiserweight division. It's actually for the IBO World Cruiserweight title, which is a title that's not really in the top four titles in the, in the sanctioning body food chain, to be totally honest. So it's really a title that's kind of not classed as a world title. But anyway, Ola Afalabi, this is his chance to try and get that win over Marco Huck. Of course, Marco Huck, Captain Marco Huck, has won two of the three. And of course, the draw was there as well. But Marco Huck, in his last couple of performances, hasn't really looked too great. He had a close-ish kind of fight with a guy called Mirko Larghetti. That was in 2014. And of course, he's only fought once since that fight in 2014. It was almost one year to that day. So... Really, it's kind of been, he hasn't been in the ring, of course, since August of last year, but the, you know, 2015, but the time before that was August of 2014. So he hasn't really been extremely active. And his last fight, he got knocked out in the 11th round and lost his WBO World Cruiserweight title to Christoph Glowacki, who is a real, real, real good fighter. Of course, he's 25 and 0 with 16 knockouts. He's probably the best of all the cruiserweights at the moment. So this should be an intriguing clash, and I really do, I really do hope that Ola Afalabi can actually get the win here. Of course, Ola Afalabi now boasting a record of 22 wins, four losses, and four draws, and Marco Huck, 38 wins, three losses, and one draw. There's only one fight on BoxRec announced on the undercard, and that's Cecilia Bracus. Of course, that's the that's the lady who's 27 and oh, she's the world WBC, WBA, IBF, and WBO welterweight champion. Of course, she's also got the IBO, so she's got WBC, WBA, IBF, IBO, and WBO, all the titles basically in the welterweight division. She is a lady that is also sharing Vladimir Klitschko's trainer, Jonathan Banks. He looks after her, so she's in a fight against a a, a lady called Chris Namus, who has a record of 21 and 3. So Cecilia Bracus, a real, real, real good champion in the female side of the sport, which is interesting to see. I like that. I kind of like that. This this card is actually, it's got a world title fight, you know, a men's world title fight, and it's also got a women's world title fight. So it's good to sort of mix it up a little bit. We're going to move over from Germany now. We're going to go straight over to York Hall. There's a little card that we should mention over there. Dan Woodgate, top of the bill, 13 and 2, his record. This is for the vacant Southern area cruiserweight title he faces Wadi Camacho Wadi Camacho with a record of 14 wins and five losses on that undercard of course we spoke to him last week Ben Jones 20 wins five losses and one draw his opponent still hasn't been announced yet but that should be a good contest and now we're going to go over to the big one the big one the big one in Manchester Arena of course, it was the MEN. It was the Phones for You arena. I'm not even sure what it's called now. Carl Frampton tops the bill against Scott Quigg. Carl Frampton, 21-0. and 0. He puts his IBF World Super Bantamweight title on the line. He faces Scott Quigg, 31-0 and 0, with two draws. He puts his WBA Super World Super Bantamweight title on the line. Ayaz, talk to me about this fight. Well, this is going to be a cracker for the super uh, super bantamweight uh, division. I reckon, in my opinion, I'm going for a Frampton win by unanimous decision. This, I'll tell you why. I like Quig, yeah. He's got good punching power. But I reckon Frampton's got the brains. And I reckon he'll box and move him. Well, there's um, a, a, a Frampton points win has got some good odds in the betting shops. But... It's a t- it's such a tough fight. It's a really, really tough fight. I don't think I'm going to be able to pick it. I'm not really one of these people that changes their mind all the time. I, I'm not going to lie. I had my, my mind completely set on Carl Frampton for a long, long time. Seeing Scott Quigg lately, he's he's absolutely on fire at the minute. And the momentum is definitely with Scott Quigg. Carl Frampton's last fight, he didn't look too great. It's a really, really, really pick and fight here. It's a real pick and fight. It's, it's really hard to split these two. Of course, both of them. 
You know, both of them unbeaten. Somebody's O has got to go, although that Scott Quigg's also got the two draws. But this is a real massive fight, and it's it's great to see a unification fight. doesn't matter that it's in the Super Bantamweight division. doesn't matter if it's in the heavyweight division, whatever division. It's fantastic to see a unification fight on British soil. So this should be an absolute cracker. The power, who's who's got the edge on the power? I don't know. Scott Quigg, he, he can really bang, but I think his power is underrated. Carl Frampton, he can really bang. A lot of people know about his power. It's just going to be an absolutely intriguing fight. Of course, it's on Sky Box Office. It's, you know, you've got to just tune into this fight. It's going to be absolutely incredible. On the undercard of that, for the vacant WBC silver super bantamweight title, so the same division, Gavin McDonald faces Jorge Sanchez. Now, of course, we had Gavin McDonald's trainer on, on the show a couple of shows back. That was Dave Caldwell. He was talking to us about Jorge Sanchez, their opponent. Jorge Sanchez, 15-0, and 0, okay? 15-0 and 0 with nine knockouts. As Dave Caldwell said, any footage that they've seen of him, he looks an absolute beast. All his fights have actually been in Panama. So he's coming over here. He's making the long journey to face our very own Gavin McDonald, a friend of the show. Gavin McDonald, 14-0 and with two draws. Jorge Sanchez, of course, 15-0. and So, of course, this is going to be a massive fight for Gavin McDonald. If he wins this fight, because this is actually an eliminator for the WBC title, if he wins this fight, it's not a final eliminator, it's just an eliminator. So he'll be on track to to getting that WBC shot, which is absolutely brilliant for him. Hopefully he can join his brother Jamie on the world title scene. Isaac Lowe is also on the bill. He faces Marco McCulloch. Isaac Lowe, 11-0 with one draw. And Marco McCulloch, 14-2. and two. This is for the vacant Commonwealth featherweight title. Also on the bill, we had him on last week's show. Miles Shinquin, 12-0. and 0. He faces Josea Burton, 14-0. Again, somebody's O has got to go. This is for the vacant British light heavyweight title. Also on the bill, Ryan Burnett, 12-0. and 0. He faces off against Anthony Settle, 21 and 4. This is for the vacant WBC international bantamweight title. Also, good friend of the show and good friend of mine, Charlie Edwards. He's in a 10 rounder. This is against Luke Wilton. Again, this is an eliminator for the British title. Charlie Edwards, 6 and 0. Luke Wilton, 16 and 4 with the one draw. Conrad Cummins also on the bill. He, at the moment, is 7 and 0 with the one draw. He faces Giga Nadaridzi. Nadaridzi. 18 wins, 7 losses and 1 draw. That's only an 8-rounder in the middleweight division. Josh Taylor also on the bill. He looks to move to 4-0. and Marcus Morrison, he's also on the bill. He looks to move to 9-0. and And a fella named Scott Fitzgerald is making his debut in a 4-rounder against Ben Heap. So a, a nice bit of exposure for him on his first fight of his pro career. We're now going to move over to America in California. Leo Santa Cruz, he tops the bill against Kiko Martinez. Now, of course, British fans will be very familiar with Kiko Martinez. Carl Frampton had two fights with him. He, he beat him twice and Scott Quigg absolutely demolished him in round two. So that was an absolutely, that, that fight was a fantastic fight. Since that fight, Kiko Martinez has been back. He's had three fights, if I'm not mistaken. All of them have took place in Spain. Two knockouts, one went the distance. He's back in the world title mix. Leo Santa Cruz, 31-0 and with one draw, puts his WBA Super World Featherweight title on the line. Kiko Martinez now 35 wins and six losses. How do you see this fight going, Ayaz? In my opinion, I think that Leo Santa Cruz wins this quite comfortably. I think Kiko Martinez is over the hill. Of course, the real fight in these lower weight class divisions is Carl Frampton and Scott Quigg, or Scott Quigg and Carl Frampton. It's not this fight. This is pretty much Kiko Martinez. This is pretty much their leftovers, and Leo Santa Cruz is chewing it up. Do you think he gets an easy win here? Yeah, I rec- you know what? I'll tell you something, yeah. I, I reckon Leo Santa Cruz beats him easily. I, pro- I even reckon that Leo Santa Cruz knocks him out. Yeah, you've probably got a point there. Of course, Leo Santa Cruz, he's one of the best fighters in the world. So I think he should make easy work of 
Kiko Martinez. I want to mention a heavyweight clash on the undercard of that fight. Gerald Washington, 16-0 with one draw. He faces Oscar Rivas, who's 18-0. This should be a really, really cracking contest. Oscar Rivas, 18-0 with 13 knockouts. And Gerald Washington, 16-0 with the one draw with 11 knockouts. This is a real crossroads fight, a really, really good fight. It's only scheduled for 10 rounds, but everybody should keep an eye on that one and see what happens with the result of that. That's going to be an absolute barnstormer, which is which has got the potential to steal the show. We're also going to move over to another massive fight in MSG in Madison Square Garden, New York. Terence Crawford tops the bill against Hank Lundy. So Terence Crawford now 27-0. and 0. He faces Henry Lundy or Hank Lundy who has a record of 26 wins, five losses and one draw. Terence puts his WBO World Super Lightweight title on the line. What a fight. What a fighter that Terence Crawford is. And what a fight this is shaping up to be, Ayaz. How, how much are you looking forward to this one? Yeah, I'm looking forward to Terence Crawford fighting. I reckon he's a, I reckon he's a powerful fan, uh, boxer, in my opinion. He's, he's got very... He's very good. And uh, to be honest, in this fight, I see, him, I see Crawford knocking out Hank, Hank Lundy. Yeah, to be honest, look, you know, I, I'd have to say I do too. Um, a lot of people are making a lot of noise about the fact that Henry Lundy, Hank Lundy, he's only won four of his last eight fights. He's lost four of them as well. So we're going to start from the first loss in 2012. He lost a majority decision to Raimondo Beltran. He then went on to face Victor Postel. He lost unanimously after 12 rounds. He then picked up two or three three wins in a row um, against really opponents that I don't really know too much about. And then he went on to face Thomas Delorme. He lost a split decision. And then he went on to lose a technical decision to Maurizio Herrera. So only four wins in his last eight fights. But I'm sure he'll be really training hard because he's looking forward to this fight and he would love to take some of that limelight, some of that spotlight for himself and take it away from Terence Crawford, who definitely is in my top five pound for pound at the moment. Definitely. We're going to move down the bill. Felix Verdejo is also on the bill. 19-0 and 0 he is right now. He faces a guy called William Silva, who's 23-0. and 0. This should be another really good fight. Um, the majority of this guy's fights, William Silva, have really took place in South America, mainly in Brazil. He is a Brazilian native. But again, 23 wins, 14 knockouts. Could be a real dangerous fight here for Felix Verdejo. But Felix Verdejo, of course, the favourite here. 19 wins, 14 by knockout. And he's also actually announced his next fight. He's going to be fighting on the 16th of April. So I'm not sure if that's a wise decision to really be sort of planning your next fight date when you've got when you've got to face someone who's unbeaten in 23 fights and has a better record than yourself. But anyway, best of luck to those guys. Also on that bill, Mike, yes indeed, Reed. We had him on the show last week. Really, really nice guy. 17-0 and 0 he is right now with 10 knockouts. He faces Marco Antonio Lopez. 24 wins, 8 losses, and 15 of those 24 wins by knockout. That's going to really be a good fight for Mike Reed. Fantastic exposure as well, being on Terence Crawford's undercard. And he did express that Terence Crawford is his favourite fighter in world boxing at the moment. So fantastic for him. And that's really it. I've kind of whizzed through it as quick as I could. I'm going to move on to the next guest on this week's show in a moment. I just wanted to make quick work of that. But there was a lot of fights. As you can tell, I was kind of rapping through the whole thing. So... Loads and loads of fights to look forward to, mainly, of course, the Terence Crawford fight, the Leo Santa Cruz fight, and the Scott Quigg fight with Carl Frampton, and also the Ola Afalabi fight. It's really going off. America, Germany, UK, you've got to, you've absolutely got to be glued to a TV set, maybe even two or three TV sets. Get the one on upstairs, get the one on downstairs, do the split screen, get the laptop out. You've got to watch all these fights. It's going to be absolutely tremendous this week. Okay, now it's time for our second guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome fighting on the undercard of Leo Santa Cruz and Kiko Martinez. It's hard-hitting heavyweight, Mr. Gerald Washington. Gerald, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. No problem, no problem. My pleasure. I just wanted to clear one thing up. I've seen a few... On, on various different sites, sometimes you're 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 sort of at six foot five. Sometimes you're at six foot six. Which 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 is your real height? 
I'm six five and three quarters. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a bit confusing. All right, no worries. Okay, so you're fighting, of mm. course, on the undercard of Leo Santa Cruz and Kiko Martinez. You're facing yeah. a guy called Oscar Rivers, who, who again, eighteen and zero unbeaten. Your record, of course, sixteen and zero with the one draw. So somebody's O has got to go. Um, mm. Over here, I'm not sure if you're if you're aware of it, but over in the UK, you're you're the underdog in the betting shop. I'm, I'm sure that you're not really bothered about the numbers, but what do you know about your opponent, Gerald? Uh, I just know he's a big, strong guy. He, uh, he, he, he's a, he's a knockout guy, and he, he has a lot of amateur experience. And you know, he, he's coming to fight, and and that's what I look forward to. You know, I just I, I compare him to Amir Mansoor. Um, you know, only an orthodox fighter. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that fight that you had with Amir. Um, of course, he went on to fight Dominic Brazil. Did you did you manage to see that fight at all? Yeah, I was I was sitting right there ringside. What did you think of that fight? I thought it was a great fight for uh, for Dominic Brazil. That was a great victory for him. Um, he was having a very hard time. Uh, Mir Mansour was landing a lot of shots on him, and uh, he was dictating the fight, and he, he knocked him down and, and was able to score at will. He just got a little uh, over-aggressive. He got tired, and he, uh, Dominic Brazil was able to capitalize and with, with stand a storm and come back and, and stop him. Of course, you know the only the only blemish on your record was the draw with with Amir Mansour. Is that is that a fight that you'd look to get in the future to try and right the wrong? Um, I definitely feel I won that fight, um, hands down. I, I feel like I dictated the, uh, all the rounds. Uh, I landed all the punches. He couldn't he couldn't land any uh, any any significant shots on me. He couldn't not at all. If you look back at that fight, so I definitely feel I won the fight. Um, the judges, I understand what I did wrong and why, why the judges may have scored it the way they did, but in, in the, in the rules of boxing, it's the, the person that causes the most damage and lands the most punches is the person that's supposed to win the point. And, and I did that. I felt I did that. Um, but I definitely feel like I, I, I mean, I, I just, just to clear, just to clear that blemish off the record, it'd be good for me, but I, I, I don't, I don't feel any kind of way about the fight. I definitely feel I won the fight. Okay, yeah, it's good that it's not sort of dawning on yourself. Of course, you're yeah. you're with Al Heyman, and Al Heyman probably has the best reputation in boxing for no nonsense, for moving all of his fighters through um, in brilliant opportunities. What is the plan for you, providing you get through your next fight, Gerald? I don't know what the plan is. I just know I need to take care of Oscar Rivas and, and to clear that that that'll that'll do some some. Uh, That'll work in a positive light for me to clear up my name with the Amir Mansour fight. You know, you're only as good as your last fight. And once I show the corrections I made and, and the improvements that I made from my last fight to this one, I'll be able to move on and, and uh, lock down the, uh, another fight. And then hopefully I'll be in the in the championship t- talks uh, sometime soon. I know we have um, Charles Martin getting ready to fight Anthony Joshua in April, and that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a great great fight for him. I'm I'm friends with. Uh, Charles Martin and, and Amir Mansour. I mean, uh, and uh, Dominic Brazil. And uh, I, I'm I'm very proud of those guys. You know, and I'm proud of him, man, for for winning that world title. Yeah, that's something I did actually want to touch on. Um, who do you? How do you see that fight going between Charles Martin and Anthony Joshua? Of course, it's his first defense. It's over in the UK. It's over in London. How do you see that fight playing out? Um, I saw something that said Charles Martin, he, he calls himself the black sheep because he takes the risk. He doesn't take the path that everybody else does. He's different from everyone else. And and I like to say that it takes a lot of courage and, and guts to go over there into somebody else's hometown. And, you know, when everything, everything's laid against you and, and to go out there and to defend your title, I give him a lot of respect for that. And um, and he deserve, deserves whatever comes his way. He said he wants to be... The, the the star with all the glitz and glamour and, and I hope that he can go out there and achieve that. I know Anthony Joshua is a big strong guy. He's a gritty guy, you know, I, you can see from his last fight and he has boxing skills and he's big and strong. Uh, but so is Charles and, and, and they match it's gonna be a great matchup and uh, everybody that's six five and two hundred and fifty pounds, forty, fifty pounds is, is going can can knock anybody out. And Charles is a smart, clever guy and he and he's pretty crafty, so I look forward to that matchup. Yeah, absolutely. I second that one. Um, for those that don't know, Gerald, what what are some of the names that you've sparred with in you know on the heavyweight scene? 
Um, I, I learned a lot from, uh, I worked with Malik Scott, Dominic Brazil, uh, Latif Coyote. He's, a, he's been a great, uh, tremendous help for me. I, I sparred with Brian Jennings. I sparred with, uh, Mike Perez, uh, Glasskoff. I sparred with, um, Joy Dueco, um, Avery Gibson. I, I sparred with a lot, uh, a lot, there's been, a, there's a lot of guys that I get work from that come to my gym here and we all just, mix it up and, and 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 we learn from each other okay some serious names there um of course the heavyweight division is a really really sought after division in the united states in your opinion what is your top three um heavyweights aside from yourself right now in 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 the usa well deontay wilder yeah of course yeah he, he, he's, he's definitely um he's, he's took the title and he and he's He's improving with every every time he steps out. Charles Martin is a, is a world champion, and um, he didn't get to really show too much in his last fight. But I, but I've been in the ring with him, and I and I know how good he is, and, and I know and he, and he deserves that that shot. And and, and um, well, I'm, I'm Malik Scott. He's a, he's a, he's a crafty veteran. He's a, he's a, he's a very skilled and very technical. You know, he's a pretty boxer. Yeah, definitely. Is there anyone you'd like to fi- you'd like to fight out of any of the American heavyweights, or or maybe just any heavyweight from any country in general? Anyone that you've got your eye on? Um, I, I look forward to mixing it up with uh, with all the top heavyweights. You know, United States. You know, I, I definitely feel that you know I should fight the, the all the, the best fighters from here. And then once 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 we do that, then. I like to cross over over there and 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 mix it up with with the guys from the UK and all, and and all over the world. The, the best guys, you know, exact the Alexander Povetkins and and all the best guys of the world. Okay, excellent stuff. I've got my partner on the call. He's just got a couple of questions for you, and then and then that should be it, Gerald. So I'll pass you over to him now. Uh, Ayaz, if you bring yourself in. Hello, Gerald. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good as well. Thank you. Um, awesome. Gerald. Um, from your opinion, if Wilder and Pavek can fought, who who wins this fight and why? I think that uh, you know a lot of people are giving it to Pavek, but I think Deontay Wilder has grown and developed into a into a beautiful boxer, and and he's and he's he's getting you know he's getting better and more seasoned with every time he's out there. You know, um, I think his fights, his last, his, his few previous fights has, has helped him, have helped him a lot. I know uh, Pavekin, he he comes to bring it, and and he and he's a hard nosed guy, and, and he and he's a really gritty guy, and 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 he's not gonna be Deontay Wilder's not gonna be able to press on him and hold him down the way uh, Vladimir Klitschko was, but I think he he knows how to use his jab good enough, and um and I think he he can stay away from him, you know, and land enough shots to to, to keep him at bay. Mm-hmm. So I, I I think Deontay Wilder has the advantage in that fight. Okay. Who would you like to fight in the future? I would like to fight. Um, you know, I I just hope that these these that my next few fights will, will put me in line to fight. You know, for a world title. Whoever whoever is the uh, is in that position, whether it's Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, Charles Martin, or whoever it may be. You know, um, I, I look forward to, to to fighting the best and being the best uh, world champion out there. And I feel that the world champion should should fight every. The best. I feel that he, he, if he's the best in the world, he's the world champion. I feel that he should not be scared to fight anybody. That that he should put it on the line, and that, I think that's what makes champions great. Okay, and one last question. Obviously, Fury is going to be fighting Klitschko in a rematch. Do you re- um, who wins that fight and why? I think Tyson Fury has his number and he has the confidence to go in there now. I think uh, you know I suffer from some of the same thing that that Vladimir Klitschko suffered from in in, in that Tyson Fury fight. He's a very defensive fighter. Now he's gonna have to change gears and and just um, and I hope that he can realize that. And I, I'm I'm sure he's a veteran. He's been in all kind of fights. I know he's gonna have to be more aggressive. He, he can't let uh, Tyson Fury taunt him and fool him with all those feints and and hold him off with all that posture and like that. He's gonna have to be really be aggressive and go and go after him if he wants to make a uh, if he, if he wants to make a difference in the fight and, and become champion again. Okay, thank you, uh, Gerald, and I'll pass it back to Joey. Okay. Okay, Gerald. Literally, the last two questions I've got for you now before I let you, I let you go. Um, I have to ask this to everybody we speak to from overseas. Who's your favorite UK fighter of all time? Lennox Lewis. Lennox <laughs> Lewis, hands down. He's my favorite fighter 
of of all, you know, um, besides Muhammad Ali and, and everything that he meant to boxing and, and to and, and what he meant to this country. Lennox Lewis is a guy that I look to for video for 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 his boxing style, his critique, his his aggression, his his um, it just overall style. I I try to uh, I, I take a lot from Lennox Lewis, and I, that's the guy that I watch. So whenever I uh, the, the, for this fight, I, I watched uh, Lennox Lewis versus uh, uh, Ray Mercer, you know, and it just and just just it, it, he's a tough, gritty guy, and, and and he lays it out on the line, and I like and, and you see him when he's tired and he keeps working, I, and I, I love Lennox Lewis, and, and he's he's a true champion, and I and I'll always watch him, and, and I appreciate him very much. Yeah, he he always said that Ray Mercer had the best chin out of everybody he fought. And also Malik mm. Scott, he really learned most of his stuff off of Lennox Lewis. Um mm. and the lastly, the thing I'm gonna I'm gonna let this finish on just before we sign you out. Um a message to any of your UK fans that are that are big Gerald Washington fans. Once I take over the United States, uh, all, all the champions here and all the all the best fighters here in the US, I like to come over to the UK. And mix it up with 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 the best fighters from from your country, and 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 put on a great show for you guys. I, I love boxing. I, I, I can't wait to come to to London, and my mom is a, a great big uh, tennis fan, and I can't wait to bring her out to Wimbledon. Excellent stuff. Okay, thank you very much for giving us a bit of time, Gerald. We wish you the absolute best of luck for the twenty seventh. We'll speak to you again in the future. Thank you very much. You guys have a good day. Okay, of course, we did part one. We did the review part on this show. Then we spoke to Kid Galahad. We then brought you into part two, and we spoke to Gerald Washington just then. We're now going to bring you our third and final guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome fighting on the Scott Quigg versus Carl Frampton undercard for the vacant Commonwealth featherweight title. It's Mr. Isaac Lowe. Isaac, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, How are you doing? Good. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about your fight, of course. You're fighting on the undercard of Quick Frampton. How how much does this mean to you to be fighting on such a massive fight undercard? Well, it means a lot. Uh, obviously, as a boxer, you dream to be fighting on big shows. and Obviously, bigger shows you fight on, the more p- people get to see you and see your talent. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity for me to go on there. and it, uh, It's a dream to fight on such a big show, what it is. And how much do you know about your opponent? Because, of course, he's he's got a record of 14-2, and two, a good record. And, of course, you're fighting for the vacant Commonwealth featherweight strap. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marco's a good kid. He's fought some decent kids. He's been beat twice, as you said there. I think he got stopped once by a called Johnny Mamad. I think that was unexpected, but because everyone has bad days. Uh, yeah, he's a good, powerful kid. They all rate him highly in Scotland, Scotland in Belfast, I should say. Got the words mixed up. They all rate him very quite highly over any threat, any big threat. But we'll still see on Saturday night. I think I've got the tills to beat him. I know I've got the tills to beat him. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we all round better fighter, which he, but what he's been going on, he thinks he is. So Styles is going to make fights and we're going to both get in there and give it our all. Excellent stuff. Um, of course, this... Would you say this is probably the toughest fight of your career so far? Yeah, by far is. Do you know what I mean? I fight on for the Magic Team, the, the the fight one fighting on the show, and uh, fighting for the vacant Commonwealth title. Obviously, by far it's the biggest step and it's the biggest fight. Yeah, man, was my toughest opponent up to now. Okay, and obviously on the domestic scene, slightly up in level at the moment, you've got the likes of, of course, Lee Selby, Josh Warrington, Ben Jones. How long would you like before you start getting these types of fights? When are you ready for these types of fights, Isaac? Oh, well, I'm not. You, you got to like, uh, I don't see too much of this Ben Jones. I'm the first I've heard of him, to be honest with you. But uh, I thought he's a decent kid. Uh, Josh Warren, Lee said, was there all miles in front of me at the end? I'm only, you people just forget I'm 22 years old. You know, I'm just turning 22. This is a big fight now what I've got for the Commonwealth title. So... Do you know what I mean? We'll just take step by step. When I'm ready to fight them, I'm, I'm ready to fight them. But I said, I can't look no further than my court the weekend. Uh, I'm not on there to call people out and fight. But fight if the money's right. It's all about money, in it? Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I need to pay bills and that sort of money's right. I'm not. I'm right my life. The time's right for me to fight them. We'll fight them all. And we'll just fight when I'm ready. Do you know what I mean? I'm still maturing into the weight. I'm still developing the weight. Um, me, men, me man strength, as I said. So, 
Do you know what I mean? I'm only, I'm still learning the game. This is only my 13th fight, remember? Do you know what I mean? So you don't want to just jump in the deep end too soon. When you're up there, you want to make sure you're ready for it all. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more. Of course, you're, you've got a very close-knit relationship with the Furies. I just wanted to ju- wanted to just ask you, of course, you've got Tyson Fury toying with the media this week, saying that he's he's been eating hedgehogs. A lot of all these hedgehog, save the hedgehog communities and foundations are, uh, are added, you know, adding him on Twitter and, and really, they're really angry at him. Why is it that, you know, all the media seem to take everything he does and says so seriously when it's clear that he's just he's just winding them up? Well, I don't know. They're just obviously they're the, the, the right stories, aren't they? The board, the, in my eyes, they've got nothing else about Duke because everything he generally opens his mouth and says, he's in the front papers or he's all over the press. But then again, if anyone else says it, it just goes in one ear and out another. So obviously they've got something. They don't like Tyson for some reason. Don't know why. Maybe it's a, he's a traveller. I don't know. But they're definitely all against him. They shouldn't. And I just don't understand why because he's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's done. Miracles for us, do you know what I mean? So I don't know why they're against them, to be fair. Yeah, it's true what you're saying. We had Kid Galahad on this show just a little bit earlier, and, and he was saying that, you know, Tyson Fury's win over Vladimir Klitschko was probably one of the biggest wins, if not the biggest win in history for English boxing, for British boxing. So, um, so yeah, definitely. Um, of course, there's so much talk of the rematch happening. They're not sure if it's happening in Dubai, if it's happening in the UK. That's the latest I've heard. Um, how do you see this rematch going, Fury and Vladimir? How do you see this fight playing out? I think Tyson will beat him even easier this time now because, as I say, he's going to be confident now and he can beat him. He's went off to Germany and beaten him in his own backyard. So I think if it does happen over in England, I think Tyson is going to be more confident and I think he'll go forward more. But Clips are clearly like him, not by me, but anyone says he's got to come forward and try and make a fight, right? Not Tyson who wins all day long comfortable, do you know what I mean? I, I don't think there's too many heavyweights on the planet that can beat Tyson Fury, to be fair. He's six foot nine, he's awkward, southpaw punches, orthodox. He, he doesn't know what he's doing himself half the time, so Clips are needs a good game plan and a lot better game plan than last time. <laughs> okay, and the last question I've got for you now, Isaac. Of course, you're boxing on the undercard. Um, short and simple, who's going to win and why? Scott Quigg or Carl Frampton? It's a 50-50 fight, but I've got seven day one. I fancy Quigg for some reason. I'm, it's got fight week and I've still not changed my mind. I'm going to stick with Scott Quigg with a late stoppage, I think. I just think, I don't know, I think they're both going to go. I think Quigg's the harder out of the two. No disrespect to Frampton. Frampton is a very hard and he's very, very, very talented fighter. I'm not taking note away from him. He's a very, very world-class fighter. But I just something just telling me just Scott Quigg's time. I don't know. I just he's he's, too, he's very underestimated Scott Quigg for his talent wise, and and I've sparred him a few times, and I, and I just fancy him. And that's what I'm going with. I'm going with the Northwest man. Excellent stuff. Okay, Isaac. Um, thank you very much for giving us a bit of time so close to your fight. I wish you the absolute best of luck for Saturday night. Hopefully, next time we're talking, we'll be speaking to the new Commonwealth featherweight champion. Yeah, awful. So thanks very much now, bud. Cheers. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 21 of the Box Hub podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Summer has been I as Summer. I just want to thank our listeners for listening this far. And once again, this has been the fourth show running that we've had three guests on the show rather than two. So we're trying to do our absolute best for you boxing fans and you great supporters of this show. So a big thank you, especially on this week's show, to our three guests, Kid Galahad, Gerald Washington and Isaac Lowe. And the best of luck to all of our guests that we've had on recently that are involved in the fights on the 27th, whether they're in America or whether they're in the UK. Once again, thank you very much for listening this far and making this podcast the best podcast on the net. Please keep liking, retweeting, favoriting, subscribing and following. We'll be back next week with another big show. See you then. Take care.